What's up, YouTube? Mm, 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 mm. <laughs> this week in reefing. All right, man. All right. Today, uh, what's worse than uh, Indo, Fiji, Hawaii, leaving the hobby and not bringing any corals in? Oh, or fish, that for that matter. Mm. I think what's worse? What's worse? Everyone. Yeah. Everyone. What? Everyone. Meaning no more importation of any uh, of this stuff. Of anything. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. I mean, because uh, Fiji's, if you guys have all been following along, man, Fiji has been uh, shut down the exportation of live rock. The rock. The yep. dry rock. I think they turned maybe fish on. I don't think coral. Uh, Indonesia has been on and off. Uh, uh, Hawaii obviously turned uh, off the fish. Mm -hmm. There's still a little bit of debate going on back there. But... What well, used to be just a kind of a conversation is turning into something bigger. And uh, why, you know, it's odd. I saw one, I don't know, I can't confirm this, but I saw a comment here that it was uh, odd timing because Indo actually opened back up today. I ah. you saw that one. Uh, Adam Moyer. I've, if anybody's got more information on this, share today. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, they just shows you how, how quickly the thing can turn off and turn back on again. Mm. Uh, and how, what happens the next time? What if it doesn't turn back on? Yeah. I'll tell you what, there is a uh, end of the story that is good, so hang in there. Uh, I think that it doesn't have to be the way that it is. Or, I, I, in fact, I'm going to go out and just say it. It won't be the way that it is. No. Uh, because the right people are involved. Uh, and so, uh, why does this whole thing matter? Why are we talking about what would be worse than those three things? And uh, the answer being everyone is... I'm just going to say it, this, say it, this is just my opinion. I'll be curious to know if you think this is right. true too as well. I think it's inevitable that all or most of them eventually close down. I, I'd love to hear out of your guys' opinion mm. how many years each one has left or will something else replace it. But I'm going to say the word inevitable. It's going to happen. It's only a question of when, uh, not if. Uh, I think it's inevitable that ornamental fish trade uh, is probably going to cease or slow down dramatically. Um, but I also think that it's a, on a long enough timeline that uh, we, I mean, we're already making, you know, the hobby in general is making waves and, and not even just the hobby, outside the hobby, just, you know, science in general, marine science in general is already making these, uh, these moves to... Uh, start to supplement without an impact on the reef. So either giving back to the growing and giving back to the reef, uh, whether it be breeding fish, uh, growing corals, you know, aquacultured, maricultured. Uh, but I think that it won't be like a shut off and now what? I think it'll be a gradual kind of change for this is shutting off, but this one's turning and ramping up. Okay, you know what? You just inspired me. <laughs> right? I'm going to backtrack off of what I just said. I said it so fiercely, ah. but I'm going to backtrack. There is actually an option where it isn't inevitable, and it's what you just said. Yeah. It's what happens is if we find out different solutions and reduce the overall demand uh, on ah. uh, wild-caught stuff to the point that it's like really kind of infinitesimal in comparison to the whole thing, well, who cares then? Yeah, it'll it'll be a one yeah. for one swap almost. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, but what if we have a positive, net positive effect? Oh, that we're actually su resupplementing the ocean more so than we uh, ever were taken from it. Yeah, I then actually, maybe not. I actually think that the you know some people's thought of how much our hobby impacts the uh, natural world uh, is. I feel that people might have this idea that it's way more impactful what we do as a hobby than it actually is compared to everything else in the world that's impacting the wild and the ocean. So somebody said this to me a while ago, and it was actually about a different topic, but you know, sometimes the people that are like perceived as the problem, mm -hmm. right, uh, are actually the ones that are best equipped to solve this the problem. This is 100% right? that situation, it feels yeah. like. Okay, and I, I'm going to tell you right now. I, I'd love to hear what you guys think. You can go. You can go like Google. Like, uh, mm -hmm. does the ornamental coral and fish trade impact the world's oceans? Uh, uh, and really, I think you could pick up whatever side of the debate, depending on the article you want to read. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Oh yeah. I'm sure it's tons written. and tons of research studies that says it doesn't, and it really probably depends on the area. Uh, but there's an opportunity to skip that whole dumb debate and actually have a net positive effect on those areas rather than negative 
and mm. really just stick it to the other side of the conversation. Uh, oh, you think about the the people in the hobbies, uh, like amphibian hobbies or uh, dendrobates hobbies, or you know these uh, poisonous dart frogs and all these other things, like. Uh, like you said, you know, the perception of some people is that, oh, I can't believe they're keeping that stuff, they're taking them from the wild, when, in fact, I have friends, uh, buddies of mine that, like, actively breed every, all of these species, there's actually, he works down in uh, Nebraska at the Omaha Zoo, and they're breeding uh, fro Costa Rican frogs and frogs from, uh, you know, South America uh, in Nebraska for the purpose of taking them back down there to repopulate. You know, it's a great, great, great example. Huh. So this is why, though, I was actually going to say it's inevitable. It has actually nothing to do with the marine ornamental trade. Right. Because uh, I, I will tell you first off, uh, in terms of actual fish, fish harvest from the ocean, uh, I don't know the exact number, but for the uh, ornamental trade versus every other reason that fish come Food, out of the ocean, even? yeah, yeah I would call By it zero, zero point zero 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 one. Like yeah. Nothing. And that is nothing. Total <laughs> Hard, nothing burger. Hardly an impact. Yeah. And in terms of corals coming out of uh, most reefs, too, like, I actually had a guy say this to me really, really well in a way that you can kind of grasp it. Like, it's like, dude, there's coral reefs that are just filled with big, giant mother colony corals. Yeah. These are not the kind of thing that is saleable. Right, uh. like these adult huge corals, like nobody, you don't, you can't ship that around the world. Right, right, right. What they're and usually they're like brown and whatever. Like the only thing that most of these people are after are like hunting through the mix for the like mm. uh, visually perfect organism that is saleable. Yeah. It's like one in a million of these things. Uh. So uh, I don't know if I believe that. So like that it's having the effect that people are saying. And again, I don't really want to get in the next conversation because I want to solve it either way. Uh, it doesn't matter which one of those uh, yeah. conversations are right. The reason though that this is going to end is actually there's other things that are impacting the reefs mm. that are totally outside of this thing. Like one, water temperature. Ah, right? pH. Water same temper, pH. pH. The same thing. And the oceans, not in our house. Yeah, so like you can debate global warming all you want, whether it's man-made, whatever, right? that's all political garbage. Yeah. But the reality is, is uh, the people measuring the temperature. Uh, it's in the, the numbers. The levels are rising. It right. doesn't matter if it's man-made or not. That's for another debate to be yeah, had. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The levels are rising, and it is absolutely wiping out coral reefs. It's stressing them out. It's happening in the Caribbean. Mm. It's happening all over the place. Absolutely happens. And then on top of that, the thing you're talking about with the pH, you can measure it. The carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere yeah. are going up. The carbon dioxide uh, or carbonic acid acidity of the water is going uh, up. So the pH is dropping, stressing out the corals and uh, wiping there's, out whole reefs. There's decades worth of data collected from these places for the trends in pH. Like if you think that your apex, you know, marking your pH for three months is a lot of data to wade through, and what do you do with it? Like, the uh, the data. That mm -hmm. All right, and then you also saw some like strange things. Like I can't, I can't think of the name of it, but there's like a starfish in, oh, in Australia, Australia that's warping them out. Hmm. People actually go out and like hunt these things. I can't remember the name of. It. Oh yeah, I don't know. Uh, somebody else will, will share what it is. Uh, but there's all kinds of things out there that like versus uh, picking out the perfectly uh, visually perfect organism one out of a million. Like I don't know. All right. I also think it might be inevitable too because ah, it's a, exactly uh, it's well maybe this one. I think uh, so. You you wrote here. It's not the reefing industry that makes it inevitable, and you know I I can agree with you to some point, but I can also disagree in that. Uh, uh, I think as a hobby, as the as the reefing community should have uh, should be a reason why the inevitable the inevitability of not harvesting from the wild uh, is going to happen, and that is crown of thorns. Oh yeah, crown of thorns. <laughs> Those things are so cool. Um, <laughs> They're wiping everything out. I know. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, but yeah, no, I think that uh, like as a hobbyist, we should be a voice for the inevitable shutdown of these types of practices because. Uh, over the last 20 some years, you know, what with the information, the, the knowledge we've gained to keeping these things alive, uh, I sh personally, I would, uh, I'd like to see more reefing community members actively seek out the corals and the fish that were aquacultured and maricultured and captive bred and, uh, you know, things like that, where, you know, I'm buying because I don't have an impact, uh, because it doesn't have an impact, uh, rather than just buying until it runs out on its own. So why not 
uh, why not you know, be a patriot or a voice for the shutdown of these places? With great pride. Yeah. Right. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. Right. When you if you can if you can get the aquaculture facilities and the farms and stuff built up to a point where it's a uh, self-sustaining hobby and we don't ever have to touch the ocean, uh, that should be some like man. I I helped change that because I have a tank. What if we can do it and make it cheaper and make them more beautiful and have zero impact? <laughs> Wouldn't that be the trifecta? That's the that's the Kirkland band trifecta. Oh uh, yeah, I know more, better, less. Uh, all right. So if that's the case, man, uh, the other reason I call it inevitable is collecting pets from the wild is uh, not looked on uh, very well in general. There's been a trend that's kind of nose uh, nose up uh, over the last like 30, 40 Maybe years. Maybe rightly so. Uh, well, uh, in you know early 1900s and uh, what have you. It was nothing to go, hey, let me take this little frog or this little thing from down here, bring it up home, and uh, you know, screw it. I'll just take as many as I want. Monkeys, yeah, you know, parrots, all uh, you know, all kinds of stuff. Uh, you know, and, and actually, you know, uh, like things like parrots, man, actually had a really big, the, mm. you know, the hobby industry of parrots had a big impact on yeah, that. Actually, yeah. I guess I say that because I believe that. I don't know that to I be don't true, know the actually. Uh, but I believe that to be true. Somebody should chime in. Uh, okay. So I don't really think, though, that that's the case here, but let's just call it inevitable for those reasons. If you looked at those reasons and nodded your head, those things are probably going to happen no mm. matter what. It's probably going to be a, a difficult uh, leg forward. Well, I don't know. It really doesn't matter. Let's just solve it. It doesn't matter what's causing it. Let's just solve it regardless. And it's all solvable. Really, yeah. actually, pretty easy. Uh, and also, the com reason, part of the reason this conversation matters is if we do this right, I wrote a couple notes, the hobby will be more affordable. Uh, this is probably the part that I think hits the most people because mm. this stuff is super expensive. Uh, I mean, just to fill out an entire tank the way that we fill out tanks, it's unbelievably expensive and it doesn't necessarily have to be. Mm. Uh, we'll decrease the mortalities along the way, not just the ones that like, you know, come along from the ocean, but also in your tank. They will do better in your tank, meaning the stuff you bought won't die. Right, right, right. Yeah. right. Uh, we'll also increase the quality and the beauty of the corals, meaning like that super duper awesome, like almost glow in the dark, pink and yellow, whatever <laughs> that like uh, costs a thousand dollars, whatever, will become the norm. Uh, and we'll be seeking some other crazy thing. Maybe brown ones will become rare. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, well, brown ones would be the ones you want because then you could manipulate the colors and the spectrum to actually turn it into something amazing. In fact, actually, if we do this right, brown ones will be the rare ones. <laughs> okay. All right. So uh, that is why this conversation really matters. And mm. like, do me a favor and keep an eye out for the comments here because I, like, I want to know what the community thinks. Cause open and honest, this is like a total taboo conversation. Like, yeah. People avoid this conversation like the plague. But the reality is if you don't have this conversation and we don't get aligned behind it, Nothing good will ever change, man. We'll just be reactionary, and we won't actually find progress. Yeah, no, I mean, it's this, uh, this Andre, Andre says, he says, current prices uh, must be a great incentive to aquaculture companies out there. Uh, I would say, I would agree, but the cost of bringing an aquaculture facility or a company to the point where it can supply enough to drive down the prices of their corals, uh, that's a hurdle that you got to get through initially. And okay, so and we're there's at scale, it's just not there yet. So here's uh, like my belief on that piece of it is that it actually isn't that expensive mm -hmm. to farm corals. Okay, and there's two ways to farm. One, you could farm them indoors, uh, you know, in the United States. Raceways, right? lights, yeah. No, Anywhere in the United States, doesn't matter where you are, landlocked or not. Yeah, there's yeah. greenhouses and stuff uh, as well. I think ORA does a lot of it in greenhouses, just uses the sun. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought that uh, Tidal Gardens did that for a while. It doesn't, and they had a green does. horse. Yeah, so. I don't know. I don't know if they use just the lights or not, but there's a lot of different solutions for this. Actually, I saw, uh, oh, I'm, I'm thinking of space in his name. He used to do a lot of speeches. Well, anyway, there's a lot of uh, propagation people out there that would you know, use just natural light. Yeah. But also natural light, mariculture, mm. right? So like just, I mean, if you really think about it, why are we walking around plucking the corals out of an actual reef when like you just pluck some frags out and yeah. put them on some trays 
and and grow send them, them back out there and, and grow. And, and, and like, why am I wandering through a reef, even looking through all the brown ones for the yeah. nice one? I can just grow nice ones. <laughs> one for the hobby, one for the ocean. Yeah. One for the hobby, one for the ocean. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think the big problem, though, becomes, especially if you're going to farm in, in the United States and you're going to buy all the lights and the facility and all that stuff, there is two pieces to it. Yeah. One, uh, it's really expensive to build out. It's not so expensive to operate. To, to maintain. Yeah. Right. To operate, it's electricity, salt and water, yeah, all that yeah. kind of stuff. But to build it out, man, to mm. build out something that is capable of replacing what happens in the ocean is multiple facilities across the oh entire yeah. nation. Oh yeah. This is a $10 million, maybe $20 million operation, right? Yeah. It, it is going to take a really significant, I mean, I did this in my basement and it cost me 20 grand to be unsuccessful. Mm. Yeah. You know, so uh, like my very first attempt at this, my tanks thriving, I uh, did it in the basement. The second part of it is why you're not always successful with it is you actually have to find the demand. So if you're gonna go build a $20 million facility, you have to like actually have somebody willing to buy quite a few of these things. To get to you know? get your money back, yeah. Yeah, and, and like part of the, the part of the aspect of this is a lot of times that like these operations are small and they sell direct to the public, they aren't self-marketed, or they are self-marketed, mm. they're not really supplying changing the supply from wild uh, to farm. So Yeah. It, it's, it, it is a, a actual uh, hurdle to get across here. I actually think, uh, you know, growing, uh, there's a concern for me too, is, is you know, everybody, the, the conversation has been passed around several times over the uh, decades is, you know, can we uh, as hobbyists repopulate the ocean and things like that? But uh, there's a concern there for me in that, you know, the 160 full of, gorgeous, beautiful, giant colonies. Uh, as a reefer who doesn't know, you know the entire process of how I uh, repopulate the ocean, why couldn't I just uh, cut a few of these frags, send them out to somebody who's gonna send them out to the ocean? My concern with that is though, uh, what are you gonna the, well, the, the pests. I know there's acroeat and flatworms in there. If I take that out to the ocean, uh, am I going to harm or well, those things came detriment. from the ocean, there's, so there's predators for that out there, yeah. right? And right, there's right, also right. enough growth, probably, to handle it. To keep it yeah. down, yeah. But the same point is, like, you don't want to take corals from an area and plant them in a new area, per se. Like, right, you're right. going to keep Fiji corals in Fiji. You know? <laughs> but, yeah. but here's the thing is, like, one of uh, the mariculture methods uh, that I've heard, or one of the what they're trying to work on, this is what I've heard in, in Indonesia when they're working on mariculture, is what they would really like you to do is you know go take the coral you know the mother colony from the reef so be it grow and frag it out and uh, all the hundred frags you make from this you're actually not allowed to sell those things you're gonna have to take some portion of those things mm -hmm. and grow them out again and and like i don't remember the actual number but it was like three generations of this you have to actually go replant the coral back onto a reef before you can actually still start selling the harvest. Mm. Net positive, right? So like, you know, you watch these videos on the like dark hobby or all that garbage. Right, right. You know what? Net positive means that we're actually putting way more coral restoration in, not because we're sending a check to the right fund. Right. We're actually doing the actual work, ah, right? Yeah. And for every coral that came out of it, in fact, no coral actually came out because you had to like grow it off of another coral after another coral before you could even take anything out. Right. So not only did nothing come out really, but we replanted it back in, in areas where it's struggling. Now, uh, you know, there's bad actors in the world and you're gonna have to regulate against that. But if there's more good actors than bad, net positive. Mm. Yep. I think there's also uh, one of the hurdles with, you know, having something like this catch on in those inevitable shutdown places like Indo and Fiji is, uh, uh, I think you need to, you think you need to make a, a case, you know, like a, a subject case. So here in the United States, you know, let you know start a program where you repopulate some of the uh, reefs and stuff around the the states. Something that we're in control of. Show that it can be done, and there's a net positive. 
and then all of those governmental, uh, you know, trying to do the same thing worldwide turns into a government, uh, government, government, government type red tape debate on can we do this in Indo? Can we do it in Fiji? Can we do it you know, around the world or, or whatnot? Well, start somewhere where you show that it works and then pitch it to the rest of the world. That's a good example, man. You create one good, solid working model with ethical people, ethical players. Show how it's done. And to be frank, man, like every yeah. government doesn't have to trust every last uh, person uh, out there, mm -hmm. right? They can pick good players and they can actually flex their muscle a little bit and make sure that you're uh, a good actor, yeah. right? Uh, and I think they've been doing that actually. I mean, as stressful as this has been, uh, the Indonesian stuff and the Fiji stuff and all that, uh, they are. They're flexing the little muscle a little bit, trying to make sure, man, that the actors are good. And while people might be mad, in the end, I think probably should be thankful uh, as, uh, you know, we think about the bigger picture. Hmm. Okay, so I think, though, uh, I saw this first coat, uh, one here from the Crimson Ghost. It's all, I've always been willing to pay more for uh, captive bred wildlife. All right. So I think the beginning of this conversation will start there. Right. Because somebody has to fund the like super gigantic $20 million four location. <laughs> we, I say four locations because you don't really want to ship this stuff overnight and you're like, and traveling and shipping it yeah. fast and yeah. all that stuff, hopefully straight from the facility. And also like every place has its own problem. Minnesota has uh, tornadoes, you know, Louisiana mm. has hurricanes, Florida has hurricanes, you know, like, uh, uh, California has power outages and earthquakes. Yeah. You, know, you can't like, put all your eggs in one basket. No, spread it out. It has to be spread yeah, out. That right? makes sense. So there'll probably be a bunch of facilities around there. And somebody's, it probably will get a little bit more expensive in the end. In the beginning, rather, I mean. But once the facility's paid for, yeah. it should be way, way cheaper, actually. Mm. Right? Uh, because the stuff isn't actually that hard uh, to grow. It's just light and water, man. Uh, mm. And even the energy of the light isn't particularly expensive considering what's growing in it. You know? So I wonder if, uh, I mean, obviously facility, facilities like this exist already out there. Um, like how do we fund them? Well, I don't know. I wanted to share one more piece, though. The reason, I, I'd be curious if, if uh, the Crimson uh, gentleman could tell us why he's willing to pay more, mm -hmm. right? Because I think that, and we'll get to the funding piece, uh, the, why would you be willing to pay for more? And I think that's a good question because there are people that just don't care one way or another, and there are mm -hmm. people that really care, but, like, everyone will care if it directly benefits you, you know? Yeah. Uh, and so, like... You can debate that whole matrix all you want, but it doesn't matter, man. If you can make it clearly in your advantage, win, 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 right? Well, it's probably uh, part of that is, you know, why would you pay more money for this? It's, uh, some of that could probably be the same reason of why uh, some people have gone away from using plastics. Uh, and even though not everybody in the world is doing it, but uh, there's some kind of like self-satisfaction that, hey, you know what, at least I'm not impacting. Well, I'm going to give you one more. And I'll tell you, one group of people have really figured it out. Uh. The acro people. Oh. Right? Uh, the stickheads have figured it out, uh, why this is so much better. And it's because when I pull the stuff out of the ocean, uh, acro eating with flatworms and all that other stuff is on the table. But the big thing is, is often my euphilia, like my frog spawn, won't actually dramatically change color and brown out and all mm. that things unless I'm really screwing this up. But the acro, when I move the acro from Fiji light, Fiji chemistry, you know, mm. Fiji flow, all that stuff, and I move it into an aquarium, brown out. Yeah. You know, oh. often mortality. Or mortality, well. yeah. All right. When I take uh, a coral and I hit up a WWC, TSA, uh, Battle Corals, all those guys, and they farmed them right then and there. And when I say I want one, they give you a clipping, they send it overnight to your house. It's never seen another facility. It had only one, uh, 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 one day out of the water. And it was grown under artificial light, artificial seawater, artificial flow, chemistry, just like your aquarium. The chances that it maintains its color, its beauty, its health, skyrocket. Oh yeah. Right? 
Yeah, it's lived in a world where it's uh, become, you know, accustomed to, oh, the lights weren't on today, or, oh, the flow got, uh, the power head got dirty, I've got 30% less flow, and, oh, my water chemistry had changed over two weeks, you know. Uh, it kind of develops this, uh, you know, it kind of almost evolves into a different coral where that it's more, uh, or it's less likely to be hurt by stress. Okay. Uh, so, it, you know, it's a, it's a longer lasting coral. It's a, you know, you can actually trade these things around or got to collect them all. Send po big Pokemon, giant right? colonies and without losing the possibility of losing them. Yeah. How many actors can you collect in a tank? Every shade of oh, the crayon a, box, man. There's way too yeah. many. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's a never-ending collection of that stuff. It is super cool for that reason, right? Mm. And especially when, you know, the other reason that you see these uh, uh, grown this way is because there are the artistically perfect acro colony is like one in several hundred thousand, man. And you mm. spending all that energy hunting down that one is a lot of work. Like, I've, I've seen the videos of the TSA guys going to Indonesia and diving at night with the little fluorescent lights, yeah. trying to pick out the one. <laughs> so they can come back and farm it to give it to all of you guys and scale. Not just one person who found that one, mm. but now everyone gets that one. Yeah. Yeah, so a totally different uh, uh, scale. So when you start to think about why this matters and like well, why I should care, I mean, you can care about the planet, you can care about the plastics, but everybody cares about themselves. So, uh, like, it, it's the trifecta do you again. Want, do you want a coral that you're almost guaranteed success just when you put it in your tank because it's lived in that life for its entire, you know, growth? Yeah, I want that coral. And I want to say I care about all three things, and but part of the reason is, like, I just don't want to care. Like, one of those reasons hits everyone, so it's a no-brainer mm. to do, right? I mean, I've bought... Some mini colonies for, uh, that were freshly shipped from Indo and stuff like that. Where, uh, so you put them in the thing, I mean, they look fantastic, uh, and they're just not accustomed to my tank and my parameters, and they die. But you spend a lot of money on them. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you this question, then: Like the the would you pay more? Like let's just say give it into like mm -hmm. some dynamics here. Like, all right, I could buy a fifty dollar like wild caught frag that looks beautiful. Mm -hmm. but has a 50% chance of browning out or dying. <laughs> or I could buy a $100 frag that almost certainly will look exactly the way that the mother colony looked and will thrive. Mm. Which one do you want? I'll take the second one for 50 bucks more. Yeah, and like, and what if it was only 25 bucks more or 20, man? I don't know. Yeah. You know, I don't know what the matrix is for everybody, but if it was five bucks more, everyone says yes. Oh yeah. Right? Yeah. I don't want 50% death. This is the question then. What if it was five bucks less? Ah. Right? What if it was five bucks less? And I, I say that this is possible because I've seen it happen. Mm -hmm. What happens is, you know, I'm gonna pick on TSA here. Uh, but like you go out, they'll fly out to Indonesia, find that, art, you know, fly on a dive at night, which is super dangerous. Yeah. I watched uh, a t coral fish 12G in that dive, like <laughs> stab himself with the, the uh, sea urchins, oh, which yeah, are impossible right. to see oh, at night. Ouch. Yeah, so if you go down there and find that artistically perfect one, well, they flew to Fiji and they flew it back. So yeah, that one's gonna be expensive at first. Oh yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is your Walt Disney of the world or whatever it is, Yeah. right? But eventually, they're gonna farm enough of these things. Somebody else is gonna get one, they're gonna farm it enough. And eventually it becomes like the green slimer, you know, it's where everywhere. you get this thing for 20 bucks. Yeah. Right? Uh. Eventually it will always boil down to that. It, the only thing is, how fast can we push the needle? Yeah. You know, because if we can push the needle, like all the stuff happens much faster and uh, like it will get cheaper because mm. history says so. Mm. And so, if I could have all those benefits of saves the color, lower mortalities, and save five bucks. Win, win, win. Sign me up. <laughs> I mean, I, like, I'd be surprised if anybody in the audience is like, no, uh -huh. I don't like that idea. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, Jeremy says it here too. He says, the only way that prices will go down on corals if people quit paying exorbitant uh, amounts for the micro frags and we advertise the more affordable and, and available stuff as desirable. It's all demand driven. I would call it supply and demand, though. I, I don't agree with that statement. I've heard that one before, mm -hmm. that people got to quit paying for it. It just, that's like true, 
but it's actually not ever going to happen. It's like right now, a con shipping container to China used to cost two thousand bucks last year. It's now twenty four thousand dollars. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. If everybody would stop using containers, it'd be two thousand dollars again. Well, that's nice information, but it's also useless. Mm. It's like it's not ever going to happen. You're never going to stop people from wanting the shipping container. The people that are paying the hundred bucks for the frag are never going to do the. Uh, pay the the solution is increase the supply of them that the price actually has to come down. Right. So it isn't on the demand side. It isn't that there's some, you know, uh, a punk out there spending 100 bucks on them, shame on them. <laughs> it's that if there was enough of them, nobody would be able to sell it for 100 bucks. Mm. Right. And so now everybody who sells them for 100 bucks is like, shut up, Ryan. Flood, uh, <laughs> <laughs> flood the market. Yeah. So Drive it's not the flood down. the market, it's increase the supply to match the demand. Right, mm -hmm. like Ore has done this, right? Yeah. You know, they have a whole wide breadth of corals that are fairly inexpensive. Yeah, you know? I mean, there and there's uh, most of uh, like a lot of them that I've ever looked at from Ore or we got from Ore are some you know pretty basic sticks. You know, mm -hmm. your Pasilloporas, your green slimer. Uh, there's some bottle brushes in there, some tenuouses in there that are just, yep, that's a blue one, that's okay. a green one. Okay, proof of actually concept here is that experiment that we did on uh, oh, pH flow. or flow. No, it was pH. Was it flow or pH? Both. Okay. In any case, in many, many of the, the experiments we've done, we lost a bunch of corals along the way. You know, like, yeah. you know, you start with 100, you end up with uh, 85, mm -hmm. right? Not with the ORA corals. When we did that one, like they all maintain their color, they all grew, they all well. Like I think we lost one of them, man, towards the end or something yeah. like that. Like, but like, they what we called them. And actually, I've shared this story with other people. And the first thing they say is like, "Oh yeah, the ORA stuff, bulletproof." <laughs> yeah, I mean, like these things have grown up in captivity. They still a lot of them uh, are come under. Uh, uh, the actual sun in a greenhouse, but they actually shade the greenhouse house to get to par levels more similar to your house right. in the summer hmm. and, and alternatively. So, like, yeah, it, and like, ORA corals are probably the most affordable mm. uh, SPS frags out there, and many of them are really nice. Like, you like all those millies, yep. right? Super, super cheap from them, and one of your mm. favorite corals. Oh, yeah, 100%. Yeah. So, all right, so uh, on top of that, like, I'm gonna share one other one, like, uh, how we fix this thing. And, like, people often, often ask, like, hey, should you give money to, like, some fund or whatever? And, like, yeah, sure, man, like, what's that fund gonna do? Like, I wanna know, man, my money's going somewhere. Yeah, some, right? of, those, you know, some of those places pay, you know, how much percent actually goes to the, the purpose that if you donate money, you know? I'll give you an example of my mentality on this, actually, yeah. is uh, I like to give out to, to charity and do things, but I, I want to know something you've done with it. And so one of the ways I like to do it is I have, uh, like, homeless cards in my car, right? <laughs> I have a whole stack. I buy them, like, 500 bucks at a time. They're $25 cards, and anytime I see anybody homeless on them at the sign, I give them the $25 card for Target. Yeah. Right? I'll, like, circle yeah. around backwards because I like doing it. <laughs> uh, and, you know... But then, uh, like, I get to see the face of yeah. the person yeah, yeah, yeah. that tells me, "Cool, I'm gonna go buy new shoes." Yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, like, I, I, like, it is. I don't know. I just, I just. That's the way I prefer to do it. So, yeah. in this case, Biota, I think, is doing it as well. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I just talked to that team the other day, and. Like, not only are they farming the yellow tang, so the problem that was in Hawaii, they, they believed they were collecting too many yellow tangs. Yep. So now they're farming them and, like, eliminating the need for that. They're releasing them, too. Yeah. Right? And so they're adding net positive yellow tangs back to Hawaii. I bet you Hawaii loves them. And it's still in its infancy, too, is that, uh, you know, yeah, this whole yellow tang breeding uh, thing from Biota is... is so young still that mm -hmm. uh, yes, the prices are still high. Uh, the prices for yellow tanks uh, are still high, but eventually, when it becomes a, they continue to get new uh, broods. They refine the process. It's bulletproof process. Now we're back to uh, back to the wild, back in these prices. Well, it's just like we said about the corals. You know, increase the supply, and the prices will come back down. Okay, so. 
I'm gonna give a what if here, mm. right? So, like, I don't know whether you guys can all debate whether Hawaii will ever open back up for fish or not. I, my suspicion is no. I'm mm -hmm. just gonna guess. I, I don't think Hawaii needs that as a source of income. Uh, they have tourist income, and you know, I don't know. I just don't yeah. think it's probably likely to happen. But what if a company like Biota? started releasing enormous amounts of fish that they're able to breed and tells the Hawaiian government, you know what? I will release a hundred yellow tangs for every flame rest that you allow me to collect. Huh. That's a deal worth taking. That's a pretty good deal. Yeah. Yeah. Like, uh, like, and, and like I say flame rest because that's one of the ones that's super hard, hard to, to breed. Hard to get and hard It's to really breed. hard to breed. Yeah. And it's only available in Hawaii, I think. Yeah. So like, it, and the things that are only available in Hawaii, what if net positive? And I say this, like I really, really mean it. Like we have to decide about what's inevitable. We have to decide, like not debate whether or not we're having a negative impact on anything, because it really doesn't matter. Let's prove they were having a positive impact in those mm. stupid movies like a dark, uh, dark Hobby that I haven't even ever watched. I don't even know if it's ever been released or I not. I don't know. I just heard about this dumb thing. <laughs> it doesn't matter, man. I want somebody to come out with a movie that's called The Light Hobby. <laughs> the hobby that gives back, man. The community that protects itself partially because we know it's right but partially selfishly, because it helps us <laughs> <laughs> I mean, But that, that's the connection, man, where everybody wins is where everyone mm. wins. The question is, though, how do we pick, if we were going to, so I, had this, uh, I got this idea the other day, is, uh, all right, so what if we have uh, a BRS fundraising type event, uh, like, a, like an auction, auction of oddities or what have you, and uh, so, Stuff that you stuff that around BRS that is only unique to BRS. Maybe uh, other companies and all these other things like these very unique items for the hobby. Uh, what if we have a, an auction uh, for these items uh, to raise for a specific place? How do we choose which specific place to support? How does anybody choose which specific place to support? Like you gotta, the tipping point has to happen somewhere. Uh, and, there's so many people doing it out there so we can sit here and conceptualize it all all we want to but you know when do you actually make action you know what i think is i think it's actually a little bit on the store level like mm -hmm. online or offline doesn't matter pick a side of the battle mm -hmm. right and market it man this is your value add to the hobby meaning like, I've talked to many of the online guys uh, over the years because some of them are friends of mine. Mm. Uh, and some of them are really close to this because they see the eventuality as well. Right. Decide to be on the right side of this, meaning this building doesn't have wild caught coral in it. Mm -hmm. When you shop from me, it will never, ever have wild collected coral in it. I make that commitment to you when you shop here. And you know what? The fear is, uh, well, maybe I won't have some stuff. You know, I won't have a handful mm. of this thing or that thing or whatever it might be. But what you will have is somebody like a Crimson, a whatever. Hardcore dedicated to your company because that's where you stand and that's where it aligns with where he stands. You know, what it is, is I've learned this lesson over the years, is that whole message of stop trying to be everything to everyone. Huh. Be yep. something to someone, to someone who wants to be part of the solution. Uh, now they have the option to support it. Mm. And you might be surprised at how many people are willing to support it as well as themselves with healthier animals that keep the color. Right. <laughs> right. Uh, don't have the pests and all of the other things on it. I mean, so that, that is a that's a great point. Uh, I'm surprised that I haven't heard anybody of doing that yet. Of I, I actually, I'm going to share a piece that somebody's probably going to yell at me about, but oh well. <laughs> uh, oh God, now I'm scared. But I'm going to share it anyway, because I think this is valuable. When we talk about funding it, this is the stuff that kind of comes behind it. So a lot of you guys know that we brought some investors into BRS a while ago. Mm -hmm. Their names are Bertram. Uh, they're actually super wonderful people to work with. I, I was actually told that all the PE companies out there suck and be prepared to uh, like, uh, not like the world you're in. <laughs> 
I like the world better. Yeah. Uh, we're doing really cool things. I get so much support. There's actually more resources here than ever. And I, I don't know. But behind the scenes, right? Mm. We interviewed, I don't know, man, like 60 people showed interest and like actually had to sit through uh, interviews with like, I don't yeah. know, a dozen of them. And every single one of them said, oh, why don't you guys sell livestock? You know, and I'm like, I don't know, that's really not a thing. Man. Right, right. You know, like, uh, not trying to be everything to everyone. Yeah, not trying to be everything to everyone. But like, well, is the livestock en entity like as big as dry goods? And I'm like, I don't know. You look at most tanks, there's more coral in there than there is pumps, if you ask me. Well, oh, there's yeah, yeah. More, more cost in fishing corals than the entire equipment. Yeah, so, yeah. and people collect these things, so probably more than this. And every one of them wanted us to like go after, you know, like some kind of livestock thing. And then Bertram came along. And uh, actually they were a lower bidder than the other ones, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so uh, this is part of the reason why we selected them. They said, we don't want to do that. Yeah. Like, we don't want to be part of the problem. Uh, and I'm going to task you to be part of the solution, Ryan. Like, we don't want to go further. What's already happening out there doesn't fit our ethics here. Mm. Uh, and so and I asked him, like, well, what would you want us to do then in that space? And he's like, you could leave it alone if you want. But if you ever wanted to enter that space, you need to come to me and say, Ryan, or <laughs> actually the guy's name is Ryan as well. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan, this thing I am excited about if we do it this way, we will change the trajectory of the hobby. We will be proud of what we've done. And everyone will say, this hobby is better off because we approached it in this manner. Mm. That's the threshold of how we enter, <laughs> right? Which is a really high threshold, That's man. a very high threshold. But like, what I liked about them first, man, the first thing that I liked there was, I am willing to turn down what everybody believed to be bigger than BRS, actually, yeah. turn down that money to do what they thought was right. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, uh, how many people do you know that do that? Uh, hardly. Yeah, that's why we took less money to work with those people, is because I thought that huh. I could trust them, and it's turned out to be true. All right, so it's like kind of the DI resin uh, conversation is, yes, uh, the DI resin is not only used in this hobby, the larger market is used in car washes. And oh, yeah. we could definitely sell pallets and, you know, drums of DI resin to car washes, uh, but we're not trying to get into those uh, no. arenas. We're laser focused on what we do. Be something to someone. Yeah. And in this case, not just be something like not sell car wash stuff, but sell reefing stuff but sell reefing stuff in a way that we're proud of, mm. right? And so that actually hits the DNA of BRS, which is like, I don't wanna just sell pumps, I wanna tell you how to use the pump to the desired effect. Yeah. I wanna help you be successful using this thing, because uh, that's the goal. It actually isn't to sell a pump, man. They're like, mm. I don't know, it's very short-sighted. <laughs> so I, I don't know. I, so here's the, the message, like uh, just for everybody's wondering, is like BRS gonna get into the livestock industry? Uh, no current plans. Uh, quite honestly. I, I don't know, but this entity here is uniquely equipped to be able to change the trajectory. And I say uniquely equipped because you've seen the DNA in the conversation that we're having here, right? Yeah, yeah. Can you go out and help farm uh, mariculture? Can we you know, collect the perfect, uh, artistically perfect one? but then put several thousand of them back before you farmed a single one out, yeah. right? Yeah, Net yeah. positive. Yeah. Can you work with people like Biota, where we're actually not taking anything out and we're only putting back in? It's yeah. not, that's not even that net positive, it's all positive. All positive. <laughs> yeah, 100% positive. Can you do those things? And you know, when you have additional resources uh, like we have now, mm. can we change the hobby forever in a way we'll look back and say, why were we doing it that way yeah. for all those years? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's probably one of the biggest hurdles for anybody to, uh, not just Biota, but the rest of uh, you know, anybody who wants to undertake the same type of thing is funding. You know, what, uh, one of the things I think would be cool too is you know, shared resources, right? Mm -hmm. So you think of like co-op farming and stuff. Right, right, right. What if you get the network of stores to start working together because 
almost always, you're stronger there together mm -hmm. than you are mm -hmm. apart. Like, so, you know, uh, instead of uh, building, I'm gonna throw these guys all under the bus, I guess, here. Instead of building, you know, worldwide corals and TSA corals and tidal gardens and uh, battle corals and all the other ones out there, and like, you know, every store is starting to build a uh, store, a, you know, like, mm. uh, you know, if you can buy actually really wonderful corals from uh, uh, New Wave Aquatics here with yep. Jen's store. And she's got an online store, but it's difficult for Jen to nationally market that store for how awesome the selection really is. Mm. You know, so like, go to the site, check it out. But at the same time, what if Jen partnered with 10 other stores, right? And, you know, they shared the market strength as a co-op of farming to produce the best stuff out there. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. I don't see why you couldn't. Well, I, and, um, oh, there's something about like that same type of uh, idea where a certain amount of uh, sales goes to supporting like a biota or an ORA or any type of facility like that. Uh, maybe there's a pro uh, program that some of those like, hey, if uh, if Biota needs funding, you know, you know, I will ship you the the store of these things, as long as every yellow tang you sell has uh, two dollars donated back to me. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I don't know. You know, there's always a way. I, you just have to have the desire to want to do better. And so I'm really curious. Uh, I, again. When we started this conversation, uh, this conversation is super taboo. And I'm, I'm going to get 10 phone calls a day that says, why, why did you talk about that? <laughs> and it's because it will not change unless we decide we want better. And by change, it doesn't mean that, uh, like, uh, we're going to change the, the reefs and like, collecting it actually has an impact. It just means we're going to eliminate that part from the conversation. We have net positive effect. The corals will likely get cheaper, uh, more affordable to fill out your whole tank. They'll be healthier. The mortalities will go down. Win, 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 win. Mm -hmm. Right? I don't know. I'd like to see that as a future. I'd like to see it too. I'd like to see you find ways that unfraggable corals become something that we can uh, replicate and reproduce in you know, farms and whatnot. You know what would be cool, actually, is if we could actually scale this up so much that when I want to buy my uh, like frag of a coral, I could actually buy like a little mini colony instead. Oh yeah, right? like uh, gone are the one inch uh, frags, the pinky sized frags, and everything is just a mini colony. Okay, so like, how about like the you know three hundred dollar super deluxe Bob Marley Rasta Revenge? All of a sudden, <laughs> you know, becomes uh, you know thirty bucks. But like uh, David Greger, a local uh, famous reefer mentor of mine, uh, actually showed me how to make colonies out of frags. Like so, so for some of you that might like, especially the cheaper stuff like mm -hmm. from ORA, you can actually really jumpstart the whole thing. Not in terms of only growth pattern or, or growth getting it bigger faster, but also the pattern. Mm. You could go buy like three of uh, the uh, favorite milli you have. And then glue them all together, you know, in a little teeny colony that comes out. And now it will actually, instead of growing up and kind of becoming a colony, eventually it'll actually grow out and be a colony. Yeah. So this could actually mm. happen now in a farm. And so that one might be still 300 bucks, but instead uh, of uh, getting a little teeny fragment, I can actually start at a different point. Yeah. You know, expand the offering as well. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> all right. So I don't know. Well, I don't see a ton of questions today. So There's like, a lot of comments, but I'm, I'm dying. I'm this one like uh, I for those you don't know, I usually like right after this is done, I run and go back to the office and read. Watch all the comments. All the comments. I, just, I just love to hear what you guys have to say. <laughs> so this one specifically, I like I don't know. It'll be interesting to see the thumbs down to thumbs up uh, ratio uh, yeah. on this one. Yeah, somebody but, had mentioned this arc thing too. Uh, I don't know what you have it written down here for, but uh, the arc. Oh yes, you know what. This was actually two conversations. Uh. I actually talked with a member uh, of uh, one of the LA wholesalers over there who's considering building an arc. And I, I want to say his name, but I'm not sure he would let me. Uh, maybe it's underground, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, but he wants to build a genetic arc 
you know, which hmm. is, you know, first and foremost, this is, gets that piece actually about how, you know, sometimes the people in it are most likely to save it, right? Right. So I want us to build an arc, you know, that has all this genetic material in it, hopefully uh. more than one uh, location with all of these different types of coral, right? You know, with the thought process of saving it for future generations. Like a seed right? bank. Yep. Funded by the fact that ultimately they end up selling the frags to people. Mm. This is where the conservation and uh, uh, the collection and the distribution of the hobby all like come together. Right, right, right. But another piece is like at a more finite level, like boots on the ground level, while the temperature of the earth is rising, the oceans are rising, indisputable fact, and the uh, uh, pH is dropping, the city, the water's going up, and coral reefs are suffering before it. Meanwhile, every single new reef tank that goes up around the planet is creating little teeny arcs all over the world. Oh yeah, well, and uh, arcs full of corals that are less prone to stressful changes. Mm -hmm. So if you were to take all of these little arcs and put them back into an ocean that's different uh, than it is today, uh, the survivability rate is higher because mm -hmm. they've been through everything in your house. I would love to know that fact, actually. Are, like, would the ORA corals that are now bulletproof from huh. all these generations how, of growing indoors? How, how, much can they, how much can they stand out in the wild? Is it a lot more than the colony, wild colony right next to them? That's a fascinating uh, question. Could you take an ORA Pacillopora, go out into the wild and find a net wild natural Pacillopora, same species and everything, put them side by side and watch one as the earth changes? Well, and so the, the thought right now is like, well, what if, would the Pacillopora just wipe out all the weaker species? The ORA would take over the planet. <laughs> uh, but like, what about whole world coral reefs that have like been decimated? I mean, there's like nothing left. Mm. You see it all over the Caribbean. What if you put those, uh, I don't Some know, natural corals ones. to the area in there, yeah, not yeah, necessarily yeah. this one, uh, back in there, mm. what would happen then? I don't know, because I know that our pH in our tanks swing drastically more wild than the uh, ocean. Mm -hmm. Salinity changes drastically, flow changes like every parameter that goes into our tank uh, changes far a hundred times more drastic than it does in the ocean. Ocean is the ultimate stability. Uh, these not so much. So that gets to kind of the point of like actually like I don't, this one bothers me. It is like people kind of just shrug off like oh that thing died, stuff dies. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's true. But at the same time, like, there's usually a cause if you went looking. Oh, right? yeah. Okay, and so, you know, low pH being a stressor, being weak skeletal structure that's actually eating itself, it, it's just not, not just not growing as fast. Mm -hmm. It's actually at night, like, can, dissolving its own skeleton. It's super porous and brittle. You touch it, it just falls off. Yep, yep. Okay, and so, like, you look at all of those things and, like, man, what could be better? And so, I said earlier, that the SPS coral, like yep. every the stickheads have figured this out already. That like farming this stuff is just better, right? It's more reliable. Uh, specifically, farming indoors at, at very limited transit times mm -hmm. and instead of flying all around the world, it just flies from South Dakota to wherever it is. Uh, and so they've already figured this out already. But it's less obvious with things like euphilia. Yeah. Right? Uh, like a euphilia or a gongiopora or any of those things. Like, a lot of times those things die and they're like, oh, they just die. Yeah. You know, that's not normal, man. <laughs> and, like, and so, if you were to farm those things and they grew up in, in that area, they're not going to come with the brown jelly disease that all of a sudden spreads to all your other euphilia collection mm -hmm. and everything dies. Uh, unless you like know what to do and you're pulling them all off and dipping and yeah. dipping in iodine and finding some erythromycin and all this other garbage you have to do. Like you're not doing this stuff because that doesn't stuff happen in these facilities. So like, and saying it doesn't happen is too strong a world. I always like to protect myself from right, right, right. definitives, right. but way lower likelihood <laughs> of happening. So it's not just the SPS frags, it's all of it that are just better off this way. Hmm. Yeah. Can we change the world? All right. We're going to mission uh, like accepted. <laughs> we'll do our best. Uh, 
I like to get this stuff out in the world and then champion for it. I don't know, it might be time for uh, BRS to think about something that they, we can get behind. All right, if anybody out there, man, is super excited about this and uh, has the beginnings of a facility and wants us uh, to help you achieve it, I don't know if we can, but uh, find me and maybe we can help. We'll see you next week with another This Week in Refit. This Week in Refit.